What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the King's Monologue. Um, it feels like it's been a little while, but here I am again today. And today what I'm going to be doing is actually reacting to a video that I saw online that I really liked. Um, it's on a channel called Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. And from what I can see, it tends to be quite a good channel. Now, obviously, whatever I tell you on this channel, please do take with a pinch of salt. Um, I might recommend things. It doesn't mean that I wholly co-sign and endorse every single viewpoint. I'm hoping that this community is mature enough for people to be able to look at other sources of information and be able to discern which information they should keep um, as opposed to which information they disagree with. So in this video that I'm about to react to, the guest whose name is Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy does a really good job in deconstructing what I consider to be one of the most destructive terms in African history. Yes, you've got it or maybe you haven't, it's sub-Saharan. Um, I hate that term and I hate the way it's used. You'll notice on this channel, I'll only use the term continental Africans um, and even that in some ways can be somewhat restrictive but it's certainly less restrictive than sub-Saharan Africans and she does an excellent job in basically bringing an understanding as to why this is a false terminology it's a misnomer and it was something that was created just to separate dark-skinned people African people melanated people from their wider history so without given too much away let's get into the video and i'd love to hear your responses for it okay let's get cracking that those are the two busts the very two busts that i use for my nefertiti and akhenaten reconstructions if you haven't seen them those are the two that i chose so there you go and here we have pharaoh nama another one that's on my short list uh fantastic i believe that's nefertiti i believe that's a bust of a well, a statue of nefertiti Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, who's going to take us through a thought-provoking episode on the term sub-Saharan. It's interesting. He says, once again, I haven't seen our other video, but, you know, mental note, I need to check that out, given how good this one is. And the whitewashing of ancient North Africa. Yeah, so I, I just think we should sort of like, um, because this idea, this like sort of continually trying to find this idea of, you know, separating out North Africa from sub-Saharan as if the Sahara was the impermeable boundary <laughs> that nobody could get through is really a, a continually um, problematic point of uh, type of argument. Um, I mean, I'm just going to pause her there straight away. Um, Already, as you can probably guess, I love what she's saying. I've heard this so many times. This, this idea that the Sahara was some force field is such a ridiculous argument. And it's one that's raised over and over again. So people can turn around and say, oh, we North Africans are different. And it's really bizarre because there are plenty of people who are phenotypically sub-Saharan who reside in North Africa. They always have been, they always has been and for one of you know genocides that took place like the libyan genocide or the two libyan genocides that have taken place in the last century there always will be and as much as they try to restrict and to hold down and to subjugate those populations nations like egypt morocco libya tunisia algeria have very large black populations and they'll try to explain them away and talk about a trans-saharan slave trade um, which is a hilarious kind of like new excuse by the way if you're listening and you come this far please don't forget hit the like button if you're enjoying the content and if you're not subscribed what are you doing come on man subscribe i could do the help what's going on people 
slavery is always the excuse for um, having black people present within North Africa other than the fact that they are perhaps the indigenous people and it's funny how the slavery excuse is never flipped on its head because we know the largest slave trade that took place in North Africa was the Barbary slave trade and that involved the transporting of Europeans into North Africa Slavic Europeans where we get the word slave from which is kind of brushed over in history they transported so many slaves from that region that it changed the entire complexion but that is never used as a means to explain the lightness or the paleness of the population of north africa only the darkness of north africa needs to be explained away so straight away she's got my attention here particularly since we have early texts that tell us that right herodotus tells us that he says the ethiopians and the garamantes are indigenous to north africa and that, of course, the Phoenicians and the Greeks are not. Um, but he makes it very clear that people he call Ethiopians are indigenous to North Africa and Northwest Africa in particular, um, right? Um, but they are not sub-Saharan. <laughs> so th what, what an excellent point she's raised there. You know, people who were classified as Ethiopian, those of you, you know, been on Shetan for a little while, actually not even been on Shetan, those of you who know anything about your history, we know that Ethiopian was a, a generic term that was given to essentially the black people of Africa or the people of Africa I should say I shouldn't even kind of um, attribute a race to it because it was just a, a given that their presentation would be a certain way um, if they were from the African continent so they were classified as the Ethiopians and that's basically anyone who came from the African continent now in the time um, of the Romans and the Greeks um, a lot of their exposure was limited to the north of Africa so they didn't have you know great deal of exposure to you know central Africa Africa proper or Ethiopia proper they had you know exposure to the north part of Africa and that still to them was the same you know they, they, they saw these people as dark-skinned woolly-haired people as we hear in Herodotus's description in the descriptions given by Diodorus and Strabo they all use the same terminology when it comes to how they describe what the Ethiopian people look like um, and there was no Saharan, there was no kind of like, oh, well, the ones at the top look a bit like us. But as you get further south um, and you pass that impenetrable Sahara, that's when you meet the black skinned, woolly haired ones. They, that doesn't happen. You know, it was they they were they, they're from Ethiopia, i.e. that large land mass that we now call, call Africa. Yeah, they're black. No sub-Saharan required. So it's quite interesting. <laughs> so I, I just think I just I, I constantly what is the obsession that people have with this idea of sub-Saharan that whenever they ask any question, what they're trying to do is prove that sub-Saharan Africans aren't part of the ancient Mediterranean world, which we know is false. Um, not only do we know, of course, that um, people that we would call quote unquote sub-Saharan Africans um, ruled Egypt before the Persians got there, um, among others, but that they have this continual culture that runs up and down the Nile. Um, and we know from our so I'm just going to pause her there quickly. I'm really sorry because I could let her keep talking because I like everything that she's saying. Obviously, she spoke about the fact that, you know, dark skinned black Africans, these kind of same with the same phenotype as other Africans were the ones who ruled Egypt. But she said one point that I think is really pertinent. And that was, you know, what is this obsession with people trying, you know, having to label black Africans as sub-Saharan? And I think this is an increasingly growing trend unfortunately it's not something that i'm seeing on the slide it's something that i'm seeing grow and i think one of the areas that i see it grow quite substantially is right now in north africa there is a definite obsession i'm not going to say amongst all because i know many you know egyptians moroccans who aren't like this but i also have seen an increase of ones that are and some of them are really young and that's what's actually one of the most worrying and sad things is that it feels like the young are taking on these very racially ignorant um, mantles um, that have been set up by basically, you know, Wikipedia, which seems to be kind of like the, the ground zero now for racist propaganda against any pro progressive ideas and against any kind of like correction of history. They've gone like full heel on Wikipedia now where, you know, anything that alludes to black people being north of the Sahara is completely rubbished and presented as a pseudoscience or presented as something that needs to be fact-finded, which is, you know, absolutely ridiculous. Um, but this is what's taking place at the moment. So you get a lot of people now 
unfortunately in North Africa who are taking on this idea that we are not we are not the same as sub-Saharan and then when you turn around and you go like hey, you got you know you know you got black people in your nation not not a few you got quite a lot of black indigenous black people in your nation and they'll say oh yes you know well you know uh, for seven thousand years ago <laughs> not gonna be, i'm exaggerating you know six thousand years ago um you had the 25th dynasty of egypt and they were black so that's the reason why they're there well that's that's not a good explanation because why is it that when there's black people in your nation you feel like there's some kind of like historic explanation as to why those black people are there you know oh it's a result of slavery or oh it's a result of uh, kushite conquest but there's no explanation as to why people of paler skin are there you know and yet their history of conquest <laughs> and their history of occupation is the one that's most glaring and most obvious you know we have thousands of years of roman greek persian turkic arab occupation across north africa you know ottoman hun hunnic you know <laughs> so much different you know foreign entities via the mediterranean have been able to basically run rampant across north africa and never is there an attempt to explain the beige phenotype and why is that because that's the phenotype they have they know that's what they look like and they don't want to ever have to be confronted with the conversation that perhaps their ancestors or a portion of their ancestry is comes from a foreign place they don't want to be confronted with that discussion they don't want to have to have that discussion so when they prefer to point fingers at the people that are are darker than them and say well they're, they're the foreigners even if there's no anthropology even if there's no historical record to support giving those people a foreign label we're going to give it to them anyway sources that um they believed very firmly and they interacted with what in the area that they called libya right um so so Ancient geography, Herodotus separates. So just to be clear, the area that they call Libya, um, those of you who've seen my maps video actually, because um, this is not something that I, I knew like for ages and ages and ages, something that I learned quite recently. The area that they call Libya or called Libya back then was basically the available or the accessible area of Africa, that kind of like that coast, that Mediterranean coast that um, of North Africa, they used to call that Libya, that entire region, not just the one small nation that we classify as Libya now. So um, prior to them giving it the uh, moniker of Africa, it used to be called Libya. So that's quite interesting to actually talk about on a, one of my videos that I've got where I discuss kind of old maps, which is a little bit of off the cuff the video, but uh, there you go. It's there if you ever want to look at it. There's a big geographic debate in the fifth century, right? So on the one hand, we have Hecateus, um, who has his map of the world, and Herodotus seems to be addressing him and trying to correct him um, at various points um, in his history. But there's debate of whether there's one continent or two continents, whether everything west of the Nile is its own continent called Libya or whether it's not. Um, one of our ancient sources actually has Europe and North Africa as one continent. Yeah, because Libya is the name that he uses for everything west of Africa, essentially. So I'm just going to pause it here really quickly because I do find this map incredibly intriguing. Um, those of you who <laughs> I, I just, you know, maps are just cartography is just one of those subjects to me that just can only get more and more interesting. So obviously she speaks about the people of the Garamantes here. But what's actually caught my attention is over here on the west coast, we keep seeing this term Atlantan. Um, atlas over here I think I said I can't see exactly what that says but that term atlas or atlantan refers to America okay um, it's not doesn't just refer to the ocean that actually exists between um, America and Africa but actually refers to the land of America so whenever you see Atlan or atlas that's kind of like the ancient name that used to be given for the land of America now, what I find quite is interesting is they associate the west coast of Africa to Atlantis. Now, I don't think this is kind of like a geographic error. Um, I think what this is, is this what we're seeing here is the accessible or the known world to what would have been the Mediterraneans back then. The people who drew or created this map. This was kind of the accessible world. This part of the world. I believe would have possibly been outside of their exploratory um, access 
but yet they associated the people on this coast of Africa with the Atlantean, well, I'm not going to say Atlantean, or with the race of Atlan or the race of American, this kind of like land that's maybe outside of the remit or outside of the scope of this map. And I just find that very interesting because, you know, if we, you know, if we look back at, you know, books like they came before Columbus, there's quite a few cultural ties that exist between the west coast of Africa and America, um, particularly the um, lot of Mali in tradition that you can see that was picked up and obviously there is a lot of Egyptian tradition as well but I'm not surprised that they are drawing a link between the west coast of Africa and uh, America and, and it's, you know, it's even funny because I did a video quite recently about Jollof rice and I spoke about the tomato but then that led me to further research you know from comments from the community and also further research and I realized actually the tomato is a much older fruit in West Africa than something that suggests it may have been imported as a part of the you know a part of the you know transatlantia um, that took place you know in the, in the in the recent kind of like 16th slash 17th century actually the, the term um, Pomodoro is actually a Yoruba term that was co-opted or taken on by the Spanish slash Portuguese. It's actually a Yoruba term, so suggesting that the um, tomato is a fruit that predated the arrival um, of certain groups into West Africa. And so this kind of just once again just draws all of that, all of those kind of assumptions. Obviously, I'm not saying any of this with any degree of certainty but that's the way i approach history um, because we haven't been given as much equipment <laughs> when it comes to the exploratory nature of our history as perhaps other cultures have we have to draw our own conclusions for our own research and often i start with a hunch and the hunch will then develop into a theory or the hunch will then develop into something that becomes actually very theoretically sound and i find it really easy to find the evidence to prove it um so yeah just throwing that one out there i just thought that was quite interesting i'm gonna let her keep speaking now what herodotus uses um but it's also used at some points for the entire continent of what we call africa because remember africa is a roman word it's not uh, a greek word they didn't call it africa but yeah this idea that we there's a, a natural impermeable boundary that starts at that at the Sahara Desert and that there's no penetration and that everybody who has quote unquote black skin is below that line historically um, and everyone above that is somehow magically white um, shows one a real lack of knowledge of how space works and how geography functions and how mobility and movement in the ancient world functioned it shows a very limited view of our ancient sources. Like, like I said, I, I think I said this um, in another clip, uh, you know, you, if you're gonna live by Herodotus, you gotta die by Herodotus. So I'm just gonna pause her there because once again, she's, she's making a lot of good points and <laughs> it's quite easy to get kind of lost in the source here. But um, I think one of the points that she raises once again, is just, you know, the, the fact that it's just so widely accepted that the Sahara is just this impenetrable boundary that no one's able to cross and it's so ridiculous because we, we know we only have to go back maybe about 8,000 years and that brings us to what used to be the green Sahara so the Sahara wasn't always this harsh desert it used to be the green Sahara um, that would have been in and around the time that many of these great nations like Kush and Nubia um, would have built their foundations so they were built along this kind of Nilo-Saharan kind of coalition that took place which is where where what eventually created some of these great civilizations slash empires such as you know Kemet and Kush um, it was a result of a Saharan belt a, a group of you know I want to say Saharan Chadic um, Kodorfan groups along the Saharan Sahelian groups along the Saharan belt which used to be green um, and then the Cushitic groups uh, along the the Nile um, valley and it was a kind of culmination of those two groups of people um, or those groups of Africans that brought about some of the greatest civilizations that we see in Africa to this day now 
beyond the Sahara being a green Sahara, we know that once the Sahara dried, that didn't suddenly mean there was nothing happening or it became this impenetrable barrier. We know that there were cultures that exist both below and above the Sahara and within the Sahara itself. One such culture would be the Fuller people um, who have, you know, pure representation in Mauritania. We have pure representation in Morocco. We have pure representation in Nigeria. These all come from the same Fuller Tuareg people. Okay, so you have these cultures and these people that span both sides of the Sahara, always have done. And, you know, you, you can't suddenly just erase them because you want the Sahara to be this impenetrable impenetrable barrier. It, it, it's not correct. You have the same thing with the, the Chadic people um, who have a Sahelian culture or culture that sits below the Sahara, but then they have um, representation in nations like Libya where they have whole cultures within you know the the north of africa as well so the idea that the sahara has always been this impenetrable barrier is is totally ridiculous and you hear terms like the trans-saharan slave trade which really i'm not going to go into the whole arab slave trade and the trans-saharan slave trade and actually what a massive fabrication that that whole invention was basically by the the europeans a, a, a way of backdating racism and also normalizing what was very abnormal behavior in terms of what took place with the transatlantic slave trade i'm not going to go into all of that right now but what i will say is that the tra you know slavery is always being used as a way to explain black presence in places where it's not supposed to be it's the go-to for all racist historians and they don't need to provide any evidence whenever they mention the slavery word because it's so accepted i think what we need to do is we need to be on our ones and twos and we need to be on our p's and q's and we need to be able to challenge that narrative whenever it's raised so whenever someone says to me oh well this person's here as a result i'll say can you provide evidence that this person is a slave or was a slave provide evidence that this was a, a slave who became king or a slave who became a knight or this was a, you know, you've got to have to provide evidence for that because we're not just going to sit down and take your word for it because essentially historians have been so adept at lying proficiently when it comes to African history. It, we're, we are almost required not to trust them and to always challenge everything that they present us with. Too. And if you're going to cite Herodotus for evidence of one thing, then you have to accept the fact that Herodotus says that, that black people, Ethiopians in our ancient parlance, Ethiopians really in our, in our ancient parlance, are indigenous to North Africa. <laughs> They're indigenous to Libya, um, which is his word for basically everything north of the Sahara, because as far as he's concerned, south of the Sahara is uninhabitable. So just to be clear there, Herodotus, we all know who he is. He's the father of history. And it's funny, his, he, he didn't gain that, you know, that, that, um, that label, you know, on a, in a haphazard way. His, his, what he's drafted has formed the basis of so much as what we classify as history to this day. His, his words have been given so much authority, except when it comes to his um, physical descriptions of what people look like when they were dark-skinned Africans because it poses too much of a <laughs> of a limitation on kind of this European ideal these ideals of whiteness that come with the um with Eurocentricism and that come as a result of you know Darwinism and the whole age of you know the invention of the gnosis of racism that took place in and around the 18th century that came with a whole load of baggage and it causes them to have to undermine so what you'll find people do is then as they start to undermine herodotus yeah you know herodotus was a, a, a great historian but he was also a little bit senile <laughs> it's like, you can't you can't take the parts you like and then you know claim you know senility and <laughs> and craziness and you know you know he also said there were winged lions and yeah we, we know all that but when he said those things those weren't eyewitness accounts those were normally things he had heard third hand but he met ethiopians he met egyptians he met these people and he was quite able at describing what they looked like 
complexion and hair texture wise that's that's not a stretch i think we can you know accept that also herodotus descriptions of egyptians perfectly matched what the romans saw and there's so many roman busts of egyptians and they all look the same they all look like modern day africans and modern day continental africans um and yet they're just ignored it's amazing like you know the truth is presented on a platter in front of us and people will still argue the opposite and i find it bizarre there is a there's definitely a, a pathological and disturbing psychological nature to the, the mind of people who kind of deny black presence in north africa because it's like you know i i, I do I, I wonder about the mental state and the mental wellness um of society as a whole to even debate this at this stage right they believe that that was an uninhabited region uninhabited zone <laughs> nobody lived there it was too hot so this is this is you know you have to to understand that our ancient sources were very clear that in that northern part of africa that's where ethiopians lived <laughs> were indigenous to that means there were black people there um, but also the people that we refer to now as either nubians or kushites um, those were also called ethiopians by our greek sources and they were in Egypt <laughs> and they controlled Egypt for various times. And we actually have a lot of evidence if you put um, Egypt into its African context in antiquity, um, its vision is not to the north, right? It, it looks to the Nile and to, to what we would call south, right? To the upper. Such a good point. And, you know, once again, this is, this is one of the things that is, you know, steadily kind of like just overlooked by people who have to argue that the egyptians were not black you know someone in my comments the other day sent me a, a picture of the or no pointed me in the direction of the how, do you know what the sinai peninsula is he said to me I said, okay so what what does this prove you know oh you know the sinai peninsula this is uh, you know the part of asia honestly when when he says asia he's referring to you know the array the top of the the top half of the arabian peninsula which was a part of africa um and it wasn't a part of asia back then but let's let's just go on the argument that it was a part of asia so my simple response was okay so which gnomes of egypt existed in the sinai peninsula you know since it's such a an important region you know and you're not going to get an argument because what they're essentially trying to do is they're trying to inflate the importance of the the you know the asian tip or it's a want a better word or the mediterranean part of ancient egypt you know alex i just literally created a, a short about this alexandria the city was created by the greeks it wasn't a city that existed and then was converted it was literally a city created by the greeks it was a little known fishing district which had basically zero population and zero occupation and the the ancient greeks created it um and it was known as you know alexandria ad egyptum i.e you know alexandria near egypt it wasn't even really classified as part of ancient egypt because it was so separated in its location separated in its culture it sat right along the coast of the mediterranean and the important thing that this brings up is the fact that egyptian culture existed as she mentioned in this video along the banks of the nile that's where egyptian culture existed egyptian culture existed and got deeper as you run further down the nile and they faced the egyptian culture faced towards central africa faced towards the sources of the nile being the great lakes regions that's where the egyptian culture faced they didn't face the mediterranean that's why they didn't have any cities along the coastline there were no major cities along the mediterranean coastline I would like to say there were no cities along the Mediterranean coastline. All of the major cities were along the banks of the Niles. All of the gnomes, the 40 gnomes of Kemet can be found situated along the banks of the Niles. None of them are along the coastline in spite of the fact that Egypt has a very flourishing and you know fertile delta region. They didn't find it an important enough space um, on their landmass to basically put any of their major cities there so that's that's quite telling so sinai peninsula alexandria aside the egyptians or the kemetic people looked towards africa and i think it's great that she raised that point 
for Nile, the Upper Egypt. Um, and in fact, the, the, the cult of Isis is actually integrated across um, the, the, what we would consider the two separate kingdoms of Egypt and Nubia um, in antiquity, but their worship of Isis is almost identical and they are integrated um, and looking to each other uh, as early as you know, the, the second millennium BCE. So we, we really just need to not think about this separation, which isn't even a modern separation, right? This idea of sub-Saharan is a modern racist trope that there is a magic dividing line. And it is a modern racist trope that develops back from, I mean, I, I'm thinking I should look, do an engram, Google engram just to see when the term sub-Saharan. So, so before she does that engram, because engram, because that's actually really interesting when she does do that. Um, it's really important that she mentioned it's a racist trope. When Europeans use the term sub-Saharan, it's really important that we pull it up for what it is. It's a racist trope. When anyone who's a historian or anthropologist uses the term sub-Saharan, you know, I have to suggest that, you know, we start challenging them on the basis that that's racist. <laughs> that's, that's not too, you know, and people aren't going to like that. They're going to be, oh, here he goes again, Mr. Woke. I'm not, actually, no, I'm, I'm not going to have, you know, black and African history restricted by a term that was created to suggest that we are A, underneath anything and B, restricted by a desert that, you know, our nomadic people used to transverse on a regular basis and had no problem problem transversing we're not going to be it, it, it kind of speaks to what is deemed as the perspective of the of african intelligence that we weren't able to basically penetrate a desert successfully so all of the people even though they know that the modern complexion of north africa is a result of barbary slave trade ottoman turk occupation european occupation hanik occupation even though, even though they know that the greek and roman occupation even though they know that that is the reason why north africa has taken on a slightly lighter more lighter skinned complexion than their southern counterparts they'll prefer to ignore that and say actually no they've always been that color even though there's no evidence of that even though no historian in time mentions that even though there's no archaeological anthropological data that suggests that that is the case we're going to say that and we're going to say that dark-skinned people just couldn't get through the sahara even though the Nile runs its course through the Sahara itself and would, you know, present no physical barrier for people being able to transverse from the, you know, from Upper Egypt to Lower Egypt, Lower Kush to Upper Kush. Even though the Nile presented a perfect transportational aid for anyone who wanted to basically traverse from, you know, the, the middle of Africa to North Africa, we're going to ignore that completely and we're going to pretend that the Sahara is this impenetrable barrier, this kind of impossible thing to ever, you know, to ever cross, even though we have cultures that span the Sahara um, to this very day in Africa, black cultures that span the Sahara top to bottom, and yet we're just going to ignore all of them. So we have to challenge that and say, listen, this is racist. This is racist, this is racist speak, it's, it's a racist suggestion. Um, we never speak of, you know, we, we never restrict any other group um, to a geographic region like we do dark-skinned Africans. And you have to ask yourself, why is this the question? Heron first pops up in books, right? Because one of the things you can always tell is when things start to get hot and when they're not. But if you look at someone like um, Cuvier, who was one of the early... Um, scientists dealing with race back at sort of the turn of the 19th, 18th to 19th century. So 1801, uh, 1802 or so. He's the guy who um, uh, got Sarah Bartman's body after she died, the, the hot and tot Venus, mm. uh, and had it stuffed <laughs> and had her genitals and things preserved for study. Um, he makes clear comments about um, how taking the heads of mummies, which they were sort of just getting at this time out of Egypt, and her dead body uh, and her face, and putting them together, and so here's this like 6,000 or 4,000 year old mummy, mummified head, which clearly is not in its original form, right, with her body, uh, a model made of her, and says, look, it's very clear from looking at these two that regardless of whatever their skin color was, they're clearly different races. I mean, 
and I'd love to say that I've you know it would be great if in 2023 we could say that that's a bizarre example you know who, who, what logical person would take a, a mummy's face which is essentially emaciated has lost all of its flesh and its cartilage and its fats all of the volume that makes you look like you look essentially we've got skin you know hanging on to the, the shape of the skeleton that's what you're looking at when you're looking at a mummy basically is the, the the skin hanging on to the face the the shape of the skeleton and people are drawing conclusions as to what people look like when they were alive based on the mummy it's absolutely ridiculous the mummy might give you some very broad um things like you know where features were positioned but it will give you no idea whatsoever about what that face looked like when it was alive and it's really bizarre because you hear people to this day say you know they'll look at the mummy and they'll you know <laughs> they'll take the mummy of you know i'm not going to talk about ramesses again you know any of these mummies and they'll say oh look the face is narrow must be that's that's aquiline features must be european it's like everyone's face is narrow no one has a fat skeleton no one has a fat skull yeah <laughs> you can't look at a skull and tell if a person was fat or tell if a person had broad features or tell if a person had a big nose okay you're not gonna tell any of that or at least you know you, you gotta know if they had a you know uh, you know they had a, a broad nose although that can be hidden but you're not gonna be able to look at it and say well look then the nose looks now of course the nose looks narrow it's emaciated it's lost all of its essentially all of its volume um, and what you're just looking at is a skull but this is how ridiculous this is literally how ridiculous people have become when it comes to arguing ancient egypt's race because it's all you can do when you've lost every other argument when you look at the the craniometrics of you know ancient egyptian skulls and they cluster with africans you go okay we've lost the argument we've got to argue something else let's let's measure their limbs so they measure their limbs and the limb proportions cluster with africans and they go okay ignore that don't mention that again let's 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 argue about something else let's uh look at the you know let's look at the the, the skin complexion look at the complexion and they go oh, it's fully melanated okay don't raise that again and basically they'll they'll keep moving and the only two arguments that you'll hear raised to this day and this is an absolute guarantee is dna and they'll use kind of like single smp markers to kind of suggest that well you know people in north africa carry this at the moment so therefore they must have been north african as though you know descent you know as though descent can determine ascent which it can't <laughs> you know it's just absolutely ridiculous you know you can't say based on the fact that your children get married have kids and move to china that doesn't make you chinese you know it's absolutely ridiculous so you've got that kind of like one argument being made that ridiculous dna argument and then the other ridiculous argument that they fall on is the argument that she's raising here which is this kind of like this idea that this idea that because the mummies are emaciated and skinny we can look at a nose that's lost all of its flesh lost all of its cartilage lost all of its kind of like its volume and its shape and we say well that's definitely a european hook nose because you know look at the way it's hanging off the bridge it's like this is the infantile level of you know i don't even want to say scholarship <laughs> you know this is the infantile level of research that seems to be you know that we have to argue with or that we're debating with to this day and it's almost it's ridiculous because i think there comes a point where you just kind of have to back away and go okay these people are really weird and i'm just gonna do my thing i'm just gonna share you know my history with people who are open-minded and people who are you know here for the truth and not here to be fed some complete and utter you know <laughs> horse manure uh, that you know uh, based on some you know well you know wishing that you know herodotus was blind wishing that he was senile wishing that those bones and those skulls didn't look so african wishing that the autosomal dna of africans um didn't completely match the ancient let's just ignore all of that and just based on the fact that we've got this one piece of very very sketchy evidence that we can twist to support our outcomes we're gonna hang our entire argument on this this is the this is the level of denial 
and dissonance that people seem to be operating at to this day. And it's quite sad. Um, because their heads are different because this use of a cranium, craniometry guy. Um, so, so, so if you sort of think about when is this obsession with sub-Saharan kicking in, it's kicking in when we're trying to, in a period of time where we're trying to separate off Egyptian, this, so these modern king, these ancient kingdoms that are being discovered by modern Europeans um, and the sort of black South. Um, and actually I'm looking at a Google engram right here that goes back to 1800 uh, up to 2008. I'm gonna smooth it out here a little bit more. And the term doesn't start to appear in books anyway, in English, in the English language until roughly 1978. <laughs> And I find that quite interesting that the term sub-Saharan suddenly appeared in usage, like it was coined and suddenly appeared in usage around 1978, because I bet you that would have been a response to the rise of Afrocentrism. Dr. Diop presented his argument to UNESCO in 1974, I believe, um, completely destroyed the Eurocentrists and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the ancient Egyptians were definitely black Africans. And lo and behold, four years later, we have books. I mean, look, look at the chart that she presents. These books just choo, snap and pop up out of nowhere. Sub-Saharan, 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 Sub-Saharan. It's, the, the, you know, they're gonna now cling onto this term. They've got, they've got something now. They've got a word that's going to separate them. It's going to win the argument for them and this is tends to be the approach this tends to be the approach where they'll they'll find a term and they're, do, they're doing it right now don't 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 be mistaken whatsoever when they use terms like woke yeah these are words that are created to silence us these are words that are created to completely discredit our argument okay so when they use words like woke and the other one is blackwashing these are terms now that have gained massive amounts of you know or at least are gaining massive amounts of popularity so here's another quick search that i did that i thought that might be quite interesting and is um, relevant to the topic so this is a search on the term afrocentric which i thought would be good to kind of get some feedback on so we can see here that started being used around 1973 1974 that would have been shake and to the op the legitimate usage of the term okay then we have this kind of like spike in around the late 90s which were i would which would be my guess would be this is when a lot of the afrocentric books started being released then we kind of have a little drop here and then i think this second peak i think and this is just my opinion but this is my belief is this is when it started being used as a bit of a pejorative so around 2001 2003 then we have a massive drop off and i reckon once again i wish we could see a bit further than this but i reckon if we look 2021 20, 22 23 we'll see a massive peak of afrocentric being used as a negative term um, to kind of like silence us so yeah that's me going off on a little bit of a tangent i just thought it would be quite interesting to see how that whole um how this whole thing kind of like plays out <laughs> basically but anyway let me get back to what we were doing which was looking at a video let me minimize that so roughly 1978 <laughs> so so you know why <laughs> Why does this term emerge? Um, it, it has like very little life um, before that. And then all of a sudden in the 1960s and 1970s, um, I see a, here's an appearance of it in um, on communism and the Soviet Union uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the earliest ones that you're finding, I'm finding and marketing. Uh, so that divide seems to be one that has to do with economic policies and what they're viewing as economies um, in the modern state. It's all about development. So I think when people ask about this stuff, what they're really trying to ask and they don't want to ask the question, so they use this phrase sub-Saharan is, are Egyptians white like us? So I really like what she just said there because I think that's an important thing to note and, and perhaps something that I didn't consider until she's just said this now. That term started, it seemed, with economics, okay? Um, and I'd imagine it probably came hand in hand with a term like third world, so I'd imagine third world and sub-Saharan were two terms that probably had, um, you know, synonymous um, 
beginnings, you know, joint beginnings. And it tends to be economic first. So there is a, there is a, um, a financial impetus and a economic motivation behind restricting African people to the sub-Sahara. It's, it goes hand in hand with separating them from other groups of Africans um, within the diaspora. It, it goes hand in hand with, like we've already spoke about, separating them from their history. And it goes hand in hand with making them a more easily exploitable group. If we can restrict them, once again, geographically, then they have no say or have no... Um, yeah, they have no say and they have no place to um, act outside of that geographic restriction that we've given them. So it's really interesting that it started as an economic um, argument and it's something that has been co-opted by, you know, historians, co-opted by politicians, co-opted by basically the general public and even co-opted sadly by black people who are un unable to see how destructive this term is and i hope actually that one of the impacts of this video is that people don't use the term sub-saharan anymore it's a ridiculous term and it's one that shouldn't be being used i believe um in africa certainly across the black community um we never have been restricted by the sahara so sub-saharan is a misnomer and the sooner we just start to classify ourselves uh, or at least the ones in africa but you know melanated people in africa are just as africans um the sooner you know we're able to simply ignore when people make that term and say listen sub-saharan I'm not hearing all that. <laughs> um, there's no such thing, you know. We, we, there's no such thing as sub-Saharan. We've always been, you know, trans-Saharan people. We've always um, traversed the Sahara. And actually, what's quite interesting is um, you may have seen a map, and there's a map that's kind of used to to argue about the the, the sub-Saharan nature of people. I'm gonna find that map really quick, quickly and just pull it up for you all to see. Okay, so here we are. So one of the kind of big justifications for this sub-saharan myth that you get is people use this map here this population density map so they'll say oh well, look you know look it's proved here because look there's dense population there's populations here and then there's no one here and then all the black people are below and you have to understand what a stupid argument this is this is a population density map i.e people are always going to be most densely populated in a the cities and b the most fertile regions that's not to say that people don't exist in these other areas it just means they don't have dense populations in these other areas i.e the populations will tend to be smaller populations smaller groupings of people but it's not suggesting for, but at any minute that this is empty because if we're going to go on the basis that this suggests that this is empty then hey look there's a, a huge impenetrable desert over here namibia you know no one could cross you know from <laughs> no one could cross from zimbabwe to south africa because of this huge desert over here in botswana you know these these are this is an impenetrable now we know these aren't impenetrable deserts in fact they're not desert regions at all they're incredibly fertile green regions but they just have quite spot or at least less dense populations than say your your lagos areas or you know your, your egypt you know along the nile valley as you can see incredibly densely populated so you know people using this as an argument for the existence of the sahara desert as a penetrable barrier well here, here's a bit of news for you here's a population density map of the uk hey look look at the desert <laughs> look at the desert that exists in, in the in the middle of wales the impenetrable welsh desert the people from cardiff therefore definitely have no relation to the people of Snowdonia in North Wales over here because of this impenetrable desert they never crossed. So actually these people over here in the north of Wales over here, they're more closely related to people who live in Manchester and Birmingham because this impenetrable desert over here <laughs> in, in the centre of Wales prevented the people of Cardiff from ever crossing to... It's a ridiculous argument. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do this of anywhere look how, how about this this is a, a, a population density of iberia look at this impenetrable desert that exists all around you know spain you know all these people trapped in the center okay 
and we have these you know we have the the sub-iberians over here you know who are completely separated from the northern northern iberian the basques over here <laughs> it's like this isn't a logical or sound way of arguing such a point it's a ridiculous point to make so population density maps don't prove anything about sub-sahara it just tells you that this obviously is a more difficult region and therefore it'll be less attractive for people to have large settlement groups people will normally gravitate towards cityscaped areas it's just the way human beings have always been <laughs> so you know this is this doesn't prove anything but anyway let's uh put that aside now let's get back to the video yes. <laughs> and they don't want to say that because if they say things like that then you know because what happens when you sort of subsume whiteness for the entirety of north africa right you want to claim the ancient civilization without modern islam being attached to it um, and so you, and then you want to separate it from blackness. That's the only reason why people use this term. There's no genetic distinction to be made here. There is no um, political distinction to be made here in antiquity or in even clearly up until the modern world. If people aren't using the word, um, they're not making a distinction about it until they want to use it. All of Africa was a colonial playground until a certain period. And then we're going to make a distinction between the oil rich Arab states and the um, mineral rich and other resource rich exploitable states below the Sahara that are not oil rich states, right? Agricultural versus other. So. And I think that's such a, another really interesting point that she's raised there. Um, obviously we're talking about, you know, the mineral wealth and that that's a, that's a whole nother discussion because actually there's plenty of oil rich states um, in the, you know, South of the Sahara, um, irrespective of, you know, how they might present information but what i think is really interesting about what she just raised there is the point that they want to separate these north african nations from islam and they also want to separate them from from africa or from you know from melanated dark-skinned africans so they can't be melanated dark-skinned africans but also we're talking about a period of time now if we're talking historically when they were pre-Islamic before Islam and I think what a lot of the people perhaps in North Africa who are Islamic don't understand is that they're only using Arab as a tool okay so they're, they're happy to say Arab because in today's mo modern day and age you know we've moved past the time time of the sand n-word which is what they used to call arabs because when they first got to the arabian peninsula all of the dark-skinned arabs were the ones in charge um and they were subsequently subjugated and then all of the ones of kind of the ottoman turkic origin were the ones who were given leadership by the british empire where they took control of the arabian peninsula but that whole argument aside the point is that they have no interest in arabs they have no interest in africans this is all about playing a game of chess and getting the culture that is most phenotypically close to them and allows them to draw a distinction and allows them to call the actual group who perhaps created that to separate them and call them foreigners and call them invaders and say no we we did it okay um, and what's happening now is you get this movement where you know Egyptians and will say we know we're Egyptians we are still here we've always been Egyptians and then you'll kind of give them a bit of a history lesson and say you know do you acknowledge that these things took place yes it did but it didn't change the population whatsoever the population has stayed exactly the same and what you actually start to discover is that they just have a and then when you turn around you say you've got black people in your nation yes but the black people are a result of of you know immigration and 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 slavery and this that and the other but what about all the stuff that i just mentioned yes but that didn't change us and what you start to realize is that slave um racism has really done a number on north africa and actually being included into the caucasoid club by europeans has actually made them some of the most ardent and strong supporters of white supremacy that you're ever going to come across ironically even though they're not white when i like when i pointed out to and this is the case when i pointed out to a lot of north africans that they are phenotypically mixed race and most of them are north africans are normally quite distinguishable from kind of your 
everyday kind of like Turkic kind of person. They are, they don't look like, you know, to me personally anyway, they don't look like, you know, your kind of like Syrian or Lebanese Arabs. Um, they look quite distinctive. Um, they look phenotypically mixed race, quite similar to, you know, South American people. There's quite a shared phenotype across lots of North Africans. And when you point this out to them, they will deny it ardently because they don't want any association with their dark-skinned melanated neighbors they'll prefer to think that their phenotype is just a, a creation of north africa and hasn't got anything to do and what you need to understand is this is the euro essentials will go along with this argument until they've got what they want out of it and then they will quite happily write modern north africans out of the tale and say it was white civilization because that's where this is all started and that's where the goal is that's where the goal lies so it's just to be aware of what the maneuverings are here and what the kind of end game is i think the you know like i said being involved or being invited into that white club can create it can create some really strong you know racial barriers amongst those who want to protect their new you know their new invitation into something that they you know previously was something that you know subjugated them they're now going to defend that system because they're on the right side of it and they can look down upon a population that still sits beneath it it's just interesting to see I think anybody asking the questions about sub-saharan and how these ideas apply to the ancient world need to stop because they are clearly absolutely modern impositions of ideas and ideology and very clearly they are very recent modern um, impositions and whenever people say that they want to avoid uh, imposing modern ideologies onto ancient world they're okay with imposing modern ideologies onto the ancient world as long as it's their modern ideologies like the category of sub-saharan <laughs> so i think we need to like mix that one what you're really asking is are they black or are they white um, and the answer is neither so this is really interesting because she's mentioned the fact that sub-Saharan is new. Okay, it's a new terminology. It's not an old terminology. And there's so much of this that takes place, particularly in African history, that the water becomes so muddy. Even on this channel where I speak about ancient Egypt, I do that to obviously have a bit of a broad appeal and to reach people. But we know the ancient name of Egypt was Kemet. And Egypt was actually the name that it took on after, I believe, the Romans took control i believe that's when it first started being called egypt um, when the romans took over so um it could have been the greeks but i feel like it was i feel like even when the greeks were in power it was still called kemet until the romans took over but either which way one thing we know is that egypt is not a, an ancient well it is an ancient term but it's it's not it's not the indigenous terminology and nubia is another one nubia is a term that was invented you know less than a thousand years ago i believe but we attribute it to these nations of kush and meroe and these nations that greatly nehesi these nations that greatly precede our usage of the term nubia which we now use as a kind of a catch-all term and i've obviously got a video about the the use of the term nubia um in african history and how that in itself can be destructive but it's really interesting how these terms will just kind of like pop up and all of a sudden they're given, they're back applied and given prejudice, they're given precedence. Um, the whole idea of even race itself, race is something invented in the 18th century, something that didn't exist prior to that, something that you'll never hear someone being described primarily by their race. They'll always be pr described primarily by their geographic location and sometimes the two get confused when people will see things like you know you know in the bible it says simon the niger okay it's not saying simon the black man it's saying simon the person from the region of the niger but people don't draw that distinction because this is how people were referred to um when they were referring to ethiopians they weren't referring to black people they were referring to people from the ethiopian region even though we know that those people all would have been black this is where you know you have to kind of like understand the different use of language um at least as it was applied um in time and think about when terms are being created 
and how they're being back applied and if they're back applying terms does that even classify one a good example of this and i sorry i know i've rambled a little bit but i have to make this point a good example of this is that i went to the british museum back about 10 years ago i don't think they've still got this up but they had one of the um inscriptions of pharaoh sinusret when he was chasing chasing when he was chasing away the Kushites or he defeated the Kushites in battle and you probably see this one because you know you essentially like to quote this and it's like you know I Sinusra have you know chased the blacks to the border of blah 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 and I've chased the blacks here and I've chased the blacks there and I've done this to the blacks and I was just like I'm reading this I'm like there ain't no Meduneta term for blacks <laughs> yeah there's no ancient Egyptian term where they would refer to their neighbors as being blacks this is this is not historically accurate so i asked the creator i said why have you used the term black here you know this the name the term the term black is definitely not you i mean the closest to the term black would be kemetu which is what they called themselves the people of the black land and it turns out that that is a translation of the term tanahesi which basically just means kushai so the historians have just taken it upon themselves to swap the term kushai and put the word black in there to make this sound like a racial thing and this is in the big old british museum so this is you have to understand how they back apply ideas of racism they back apply these terms and um political terms and they make them seem like they have some credence in a time period through this kind of like really poor transliteration they 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 apply our modern paradigms onto Asian societies that didn't hold on to them so it's really important I mean the point that she just raised there about the newness of this term we mustn't allow you know sub-saharan to be a term that they back apply to our history to try and give it some relevance and some credence you know and both but really neither there's no white people running around in ancient Egypt um, <laughs> it's just not a category that they used they did recognize that people had blackness, black skins, um, and they recognized dark skin tones, but they, the idea of the white is, is a gender category um, or a category used for people who are cold burned in the very far north, um, or it is a category that is used for people with certain diseases. Um, or we actually see it in a poem by Catullus referring to Caesar for a political party affiliation. The black. I think it's really interesting that she talked about the fact that um you know whiteness is something that was was in those times in that region of the earth obviously associated with diseases you know we have um terms like um leprosy in the bible um which actually people believe is a disease and i don't believe it's a disease i don't believe it's ever a disease mentioned in the bible the only symptom of leprosy is that your skin would turn white um all of this other stuff about limbs and fingers dropping off that's actually never mentioned in the bible so they never spoke about the fact that someone was leprous and as a result they became you know their fingers dropped off they talked about the fact that lepers were seen as you know perhaps in certain cultures as unclean people and if you actually look the only symptom of a leper is that their skin would turn pale their skin would turn white now that to me sounds like albinism so it sounds like leprosy and albinism were probably the same thing um but once again, they've kind of like used transliteration and obfuscated these things to make it seem like it was something else. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's really interesting that she just mentioned the fact that, you know, the whiteness of skin in this region was such a peculiar thing. It would only be mentioned in certain contexts. And one of those contexts was illness. This isn't racism. It's just it would have been bizarre to see someone of white skin in that region of the earth so to to have the idea that these you know ancient egypt had you know white-skinned rulers is just really like you know that's it's it it's bizarre <laughs> it's very bizarre versus the whites as a sort of political thing or a, and then we'll see it the other place where it might be connected to these sort of politics is that it's also can be connected to chariot racing your team your favorite team the greens, the reds, <laughs> um, these are teams. The, the whitewashing of North Africa also ties in, um, you, you think about this thing, the idea of whitewashing North Africa, 
some of the, the loudest voices on the internet um, in wanting to ensure this dividing line between sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa are um, people of Arab descent. Yes. Um, I'm thinking here specifically of like N Nicholas Tlaib, right? Um, because particularly in the United States, since 1910 or so, right, the people who are called Syrian get to be white, right? So they're categorized technically, people from the Middle East are categorized as white because of this 1910 or 1919 law um, that categorized them as white. Um, but they don't get to live the experience of being white in America because they're Muslim. So, but I think there's this, there's this bind into people who have recent access to whiteness, particularly in the United States, but also um, in the Middle East where there is anti-blackness, uh, severe anti-blackness, um, that they want to um, make sure that they can make that harsh dividing line. And I think that's, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this already, so I'm not going to raise the point again, but it's very, very prominent in the, prominent in the Middle East. I actually remember, to give an example, I remember a time, I actually used to live in the Middle East, and I remember a time I was with a friend of mine um, in Qatar, um, and we were discussing, we were discussing about the fact that you know Qatar has an indigenous black population and an indigenous quote unquote white population so I was with this guy and actually I'm not gonna mention many names but um he was a part of the Qatari royal family and he was actually a friend of mine um and he, he said you know he kept saying white the white Arabs the white Arabs the white Arabs and, and you gotta bear in mind this guy is very brown you know a very 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 brown man um you know who has you know similar similar kind of like complexion and facial features to you know saddam hussein um probably darker than you know colonel gaddafi <laughs> you know and he was very much insistent on distinguishing between the two groups as being white the white arabs and or the white categories and the black categories and i said to him you do realize that if you was to come to the uk no one would call you white like no one you would never be called white and he was like yes but we're not this but i was like you're not white you, you have to understand that you're not white you the whiteness that you've been you know given is essentially a passport that's been granted by the colony <laughs> okay that's the, the, the you know they they've given you this kind of like seal of approval okay you are whites and you are blacks but if you was to come to the uk your persecution would be exactly the same <laughs> i'm just gonna be totally frank with you yeah there will be no on, on on appearance you are going to get no favorable treatment based on your appearance to the black category i can tell you that right now for free your color does not qualify you for white supremacy so it's quite interesting the arabs are very strong proponents of this kind of like white black arab kind of thing and he used to all obviously explain that the black categories are there as a result of slavery now bear in mind kato is a no disrespect a goat herding nation okay it has it literally has no history and i don't mean that in an insulting way but their history which they should be proud of is just you know essentially bedouins and roman goat herders that's what their history is now why in a in a system like that would anyone even think of the fact that they would have had slaves <laughs> is is beyond me slavery did not exist in that part of the world and this is one of the big fables of the kind of like trans i spoke earlier about the you know the arab slave trade myth that has been back applied i keep talking about the fact that they back apply ideas new ideas the trend you know the, the arab slave trade myth the idea that all of these black people this large black population that exists in the middle east is there as a result of some trans saharan <laughs> slave trade it's totally ridiculous your goat herd is you literally have you, you there was no economic prowess there there was no economic means or you know you would have had no way to even pay you know um slave traders you know you're so the whole idea of you know how people perceive you know how white people and black people have come to you know exist in the same area what is white what is black it's just really interesting to see how these kind of political ideas play out on the the modern psyche when you meet people yeah right 
Um, and they are some of the loudest voices. And so whitewashing of the Middle East is a, an ongoing long-term historical process. But in terms of how uh, Europeans and Americans are doing it, Europeans are doing it primarily as a way to lay claim to the antiquities um, of Egypt and um, Libya, which of course it's colonized by the Romans. And so you find Roman sites all over um, Libya um, and other places. Um, but then in the United States, it has to do with the fact that, that people who at the time were classified as Syrian, but what we really mean is people of Middle East descent or people Arab, uh, of Arab descent from the Middle East, they got classified legally as white. And so think about what that looks like as someone like me, who is a white person, right, a European descent white person saying to someone who is like, like Talib or something that um, North Africa isn't white, right? Um, or more, even more important is that this is actually what happened during the Mary Beard Talib debate, <laughs> which was Beard was like, they weren't white, you know, Libya and these places are not white spaces. This is not a concept that exists in the ancient world. And Talib comes after her and says, who are you colonizer to kick me out of whiteness? <laughs> right? But it's all this obsession of wanting to participate in this dominant identity group um, that is called whiteness, which has no roots in antiquity and has no roots even um, really in much modernity outside of, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a creature of the U.S., though it, it appears in European texts earlier. We're the people who sort of run with it um, and turn it into um, this idea. And what we actually mean by white is dominant. We don't mean anything to do with our actual skin color. I'm not such a strong closer. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I have anything to add to that. Um, it's, you know, she just hit on so many key points there obviously with you know whiteness being associated with dominance and it just being a label that's given to groups as and when people see fit to suit an agenda they'll allow you into the club and they know that you'll fight for that club as a result of being allowed into the club as what you're seeing in north africa and it's been interesting to see this political wedge just grow between North Africans and continental Africans, you know, and even to the point of where, you know, progressive North Africans like Gaddafi, you know, were vilified and assassinated. Um, yes, they've mentioned the gold dinar, but I also think his progressive views were seen as a bit of a pariah, seen as a cancer um, to possibly break down a racial divide and a class structure that European colonization had spent so much time crafting and carefully placed in North Africa that they couldn't was they couldn't risk someone who was going to unify various African nations. Um, one of the refreshing things to see was actually in the World Cup when Moroccans said, no, you know, the Moroccan coach came out and said, you know, it's funny how the Arab nations want to claim Morocco now that we're doing quite well and they turned around and said no we're we're African and the Moroccans turned around and said yeah we're African and we're proud to be African it would be nice to see more of that um but you know can't can't say it's going to be the case and I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath too much but anyway look that's the end of the video as you can imagine I quite like it you know um, because I think this is one of the terms that I would really love to just put a nail in the coffin in terms of people classifying things as sub-saharan I don't think it's helpful and I don't think it helps our cause thank you for tuning in if you can support me on patreon that would be very much appreciated it allows me to do more content more regularly um, I'm trying my best at the moment I am inundated with research and i do quite a lot of shorts at the moment they take an awful long time to make but yeah look tune in grab some stuff if you can grab some stuff if you can't um support me on patreon and you want to grab a t-shirt that or something from the merch store that also obviously helps me to maintain and to kind of grow and hopefully do this full time at some point um if you do become a patreon or if you if you see something in the merch store and you like it and you want it then you, you can join patreon and actually you can get quite large discounts on the merchandise as well um so just put throwing that out there for anyone who might be interested thank you for joining me um i've got some links here for different content that you can see on the channel and yeah just uh i'll see you on the next one